Okay, we're going to continue our study of an enlightened view of the Christian life in chapter 4 of Ephesians, verses 25 through 32. Let's begin with prayer. Gracious Lord, we give you thanks for the opportunity to meditate upon your word and to incorporate what it says into the way we live and think and feel. Help us in that task. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. So as we continue this study of the book of Ephesians, Paul in this fourth chapter gives us what I would call a list of identifying characteristics of someone who has put off the old and put on the new self. And we all use various ways to indicate our identity. When I first finished my PhD and was teaching in the university, I tried to grow a mustache and beard because at that time, virtually all the profs had mustaches and beards. And so I was going to announce to the world my new identity. I, too, was a university professor. Well, it turned out I had to be satisfied with being a beardless professor because my beard grew too slowly and it itched too much and it made me crazy. Um, my wife says that I got very irritable with my effort to grow a beard. So I needed to find some other way to proclaim my identity. Well, in this passage, we're going to see some ways that we proclaim to the world our Christian identity. In essence, Paul is saying, look, if you're really serious about being a Christian, if you really want to assert your Christian identity, then practice or follow these practices because while the qualities that he mentions in these verses may be admired, they are not the common practices of humankind. So he begins with a way of speaking. We're in the fourth chapter. This is verse 25. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. Recall in verse 15, Paul had said that speaking the truth in love is an essential part of building up the body of Christ. He reiterates the importance of that here. We are members of one another, he says, and as such, we can only benefit when our relationships are marked by truth rather than falsehood. Now, a lot could be said about truth and the consequences of lying and the complexities about trying to speak the truth in love. I remember we've said before that being truthful does not mean that you just bluntly say everything that comes into your mind or everything that you feel. But let's focus on something interesting here. With who or with whom would you say that you are most likely to not be truthful, most likely to lie? Well, you might think it would be with strangers, uh, people that you don't know much about anyway. But Paul's talking here about relationships with fellow Christians and fellow church members. And he says it is these people we need to be careful with that we are truthful. They are the ones with whom we are most likely to be tempted to lie. Um, why? Well, there's an interesting biblical example of this in the account of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts. You recall they sold a lot, a piece of property they owned, and then they brought some of the proceeds to the apostles. Now, there were other people who were selling pieces of property and giving it all to the young church. Uh, Ananias and Sapphira decided not to give it all, which was okay, except that they made it appear that they were giving it all. They lied about how much money they received for the property. Now, this is, is a lie to your fellow Christians trying to sort of prop up 
uh, your own spiritual status. Uh, I once read, by the way, about a church member in a small church who uh, each Sunday would come to church and he knew the church treasurer. He would uh, write out a check to the church and ask the treasurer to cash it for him. The treasurer thought, okay, he's just doing that. So he's going to give a pretty good sum of money to the church and just keep enough that he needs for some other things. Well, it turned out after a long time, they found out that uh, now he wasn't giving hardly anything to the church, just the pittance, uh, but cashing the check uh, each week and then using that as a deduction on his income tax. So again, he, he was lying to his fellow believers. Now, I had a similar thing pretending to be something that you are not that was shared with me by a young woman when I was doing premarital counseling. Her father was a deacon, and she talked about him some, and he told me that he was one of those pillars of the community type of people. She talked about how people all thought how lucky she was to have a man like that as her father. But his life was a lie. She told me that in the privacy of their home, this man physically and emotionally abused both his wife and his daughter. I don't mean to imply that such things are common, but neither are they a rarity. And even if we're not guilty of some heinous infraction of Christian morality, there's always a strong temptation for us to lie to one another in the sense that we each want to be thought of as a good follower of Jesus Christ. We don't want to do what James told us to do and confess our sins to one another. We don't like to appear weak or flawed or bothered by doubts. And the upshot of that is that we're not always open, not always honest with each other. We're like the young man whom Jeanette and I recall uh, when we were in St. Louis. There was a group started a Christian coffee house and we went to it one night and there was this young man, just young, well, I'd say maybe, uh, he was still in his teenager, but maybe late teens. And we talked with him for a period of time. And the interesting thing is he talked about the joy he had as a Christian, the joy of the Lord. But you know what? We looked at him Everything about him was joyless. The look on his face, the way he held himself, his body, everything about him said, I am struggling, I am depressed. But his mouth said, I know the joy of the Lord. We need to be able to be honest and open with one another about such matters. Now, Paul goes on then to deal with the issue of anger in verses 26 and 27. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Well, <clears throat> these are well-known verses. And basically, they say that we are to avoid anger as much as possible. But if you do get angry, you should not nurse it. I had a personal experience of this uh, shortly after, well, not long after uh, Jeanette and I were married. One evening we had an argument about something. I have no idea, I don't remember what it was, but I know that we were both a little bit angry when we went to bed. So we got into bed, turned the lights out, and then I heard Jeanette humming some hymn. And I said, what are you doing? She reminded me of this verse in Ephesians. And so we turned the lights back on and we settled the issue. Now, realistically, you can't always resolve matters that quickly. In fact, uh, I don't take this literally that you're supposed to do it before sunset. The point is though, that to deal with the anger, you need to be careful to not allow it to possess you. That's what giving the devil a foothold means. And that's interesting because 
There are some people, including some psychologists, who have advocated the opposite. Let it all out. Well, the point here, and it's given in other scriptures, for example, James 1, 19, 20, says, be slow to anger, for anger does not work the righteousness of God. So the scriptures say you try to control your anger rather than letting it control you. And it's interesting to me that there's some recent research that supports the idea that it's really better to do that and that you're probably more able to do that than you may think. Let me give you this <laughs> uh, example. Some years ago, Jeanette and I went through a training program for people who do premarital and marital counseling. And in one of the sessions, we saw a video of a couple who were fighting, and I mean, they were really going at it. They were vicious. Now, interestingly, this was not a video that was made up, uh, that is, that, that these were actually just actors pretending to argue. This was a real couple, and they were having a real fight. And if you wonder, well, how did they manage to record this? Well, it turned out that the leader of this training program had secured permission from a number of couples to allow them to come in and record on tape, an argument. What that meant was now, which is really interesting, is that as this couple started their argument, they probably no doubt remembered their agreement, they stopped fighting, called the researchers who required about 45 minutes to get to the home and set up the taping equipment, and then they resumed the fight. And it was quite a fight. The point is this, as they showed, you can stop, you can interrupt, you can stop a heated or potentially heated argument and substitute something that is less destructive. And what Jeanette and I always tell people, married couples, is that you've got to get away from this idea that you are a problem and approach it as a problem-solving exercise, which means that you approach it by agreeing with each other, we have a problem. Let's deal with it. Another thing that uh, we want to avoid is stealing in verse 28. It says, he who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with his own hands, that he may have something to share with those in need. What's your first reaction to this verse? It might be, well, I, I don't steal. And maybe you don't. Stealing was common at the time that this was written. Slaves stole from their masters. People would go to public baths and have someone steal some of their clothing or goods that they had brought with them. Uh, probably stealing may not be as a common experience with us. But just two things I want to say about that. First of all, we usually think of stealing as an intentional act. There's also a stealing which is not intentional, but which has the same result. And that is, for example, have you ever had the experience of someone uh, wanting to borrow something from you? Uh, I've had people who wanted to borrow a book, and I never saw it again. Uh, you know, that's an act of stealing. You've kept somebody else's property. I'm sure that they didn't intend to keep it when they asked to borrow it, but that's what happened. But secondly, note the rationale here, which I think is really interesting. Paul doesn't say to stop stealing and start working just to support yourself, but to support yourself in to share with others who are in need. So the thief takes from others, the Christian focuses on giving to others. Any kind of stealing, therefore, turns our calling on its head. It's the very opposite of what we're told to do. In verse 29, comes back again to the way that we speak. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, 
but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. Unwholesome, not really good translation, I don't think. The RSV says evil, but I think Peterson captures it best when he calls it foul or dirty, because the Greek word there literally means rotten or decaying. And you may remember the, uh, well, what it's saying is, avoid speaking to people in ways that are destructive. Instead, speak in ways that build each other up, affirm each other. Remember the old saying that uh, kids have sticks and stones can break my bones, but nasty words can't hurt me? Well, I don't know who ever first made that up, but boy, were they ever off base. Words are powerful. They're powerful for good or for evil. And note what Paul is urging on us here is not just to avoid words that are destructive, but to cultivate the kind of talk that actually builds other people up. So take advantage of every opportunity you have to affirm someone, to build somebody else up. You'll not only add grace to their day, you'll also find yourself being enriched. I told you before I think about one of the sadder memorial services that I have ever had. It was for a relatively young man and just before the service began, his elderly aunt came up to me and handed me a sheet of paper and said to me, this is a letter that I wrote to him. I'd like for you to read it. I don't remember too much about what she said in that letter, except for one thing, which is really etched in my memory. It was this. I deep, this is what she says to him now. I deeply regret the fact that I never told you while you were alive how much I love you. That's tragic. So I'm going to give you some homework for this week. I want you to affirm someone. I want you to tell someone else something about what you appreciate or admire or like in that person and make it more than a, just a one-shot act. Develop the habit of being an affirmer, an encourager, someone who builds other people up. Now, at this point, Paul inserts a reason for all this in verse 30. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So when you deceive others, when you allow your relationship with someone else to be controlled by your anger, when you steal from them, when you speak to them in destructive ways, you're not just hurting them. You are actually grieving the Holy Spirit of God. Peterson, once more, don't grieve God. Don't break his heart. Well, that would certainly give one pause, wouldn't it? Think that when I am saying something that's hurtful to someone else, I am breaking the heart of God. David knew the truth of this. He pointed out in the 51st Psalm that his sin against Uriah and Bathsheba was a sin against God. And what you get here is a sense of betrayal. God's Spirit has sealed us, has made us his own, he says. And we act in ways that suggested that he was not, we are not fully his after all. And God's spirit feels grief as Jesus felt grief. Recall when he sat one day and looked out over Jerusalem and in anguish talked about how much he grieved for the people, how much it hurt for them to reject him. Well, Paul goes on to urge us once again to deal with the problem of anger, to get rid of uh, negative emotions and behavior that are evidence of anger in verse 31. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. 
Bitterness involves a harboring, perhaps even a nursing, of resentment about the past. It's anger that has gone sour. And you see it uh, in, well, you see it fairly often, actually. Uh, we've seen it a lot in cases of divorce. Remember one woman that Jeanette and I interviewed, uh, we were interviewing people about their marriages and their experience with marriage and divorce. And she was really bitter about her divorce. Well, that's not uncommon at all, except that the divorce had happened 30 years before we interviewed her. For 30 years, she sat around bitter about it. That kind of bitterness is insidious. Uh, it's self-destructive. And the person who loses the most from it is the person who harbors and nurses it. Rage or wrath that uh, Paul mentions here, that's an intense anger, an explosion of anger. Uh, it's often understandable. You can see a biblical example of this in Jeremiah, by the way. Uh, Jeremiah uh, <laughs> is, uh, is a fascinating man in the Old Testament. Uh, the people to whom he preached slandered him and tried to silence him by every means they could. And Jeremiah was so frustrated, so depressed, so incensed by it all. One time he vented it to God in this way. This is what he said to God. Remember that I stood before you and spoke in their behalf, that is the people who have rejected him, to turn your wrath away from them. So give their children over to famine, hand them over to the power of the sword. Let their wives be made childless and widows. Let their men be put to death. Well, now that is rage. But once again, when we are enraged, we may hurt someone else, we may damage our relationships, but we always mar our witness as Christians and we always do emotional and physical damage to ourselves. Contrary to what some people believe, venting your rage is not only not therapeutic, it is downright harmful. It doesn't get rid of your anger, it tends to perpetuate it. Brawling is another thing that he mentions here, which means shouting or clamor. It's the word that was used in Acts, the 23rd chapter, when Paul is brought before the Sanhedrin and <laughs> realizes that uh, there are both Pharisees and Sadducees there. And of course, they're all focused on somehow getting Paul to stop preaching the gospel of Christ. And uh, so he then diverts them from what they wanted to do by pointing out that he was a Pharisee and that the reason he was there was that there were people who questioned the resurrection of the dead. Well, that immediately caused dissension and arguments and brawling arose in the group as the Sadducees who did not believe in that in the resurrection and the Pharisees who did believe in resurrection so you get their brawling with each other. They argued vigorously. And that's also a way to express anger, loud quarreling with someone. And again, generally unnecessary and unhelpful. Far better to try to use a problem-solving approach. Uh, slander is the other word he uses here, which is the Greek word blasphemia. Uh, it means the defamation of character, of people, and of God. For, as I just noted, when we sin against people, we do sin against God. Slander does not always arise out of anger, but that's one source of it. The people who decided to slander Jeremiah were angry at him for his messages of judgment. So people who slander others may be angry about something, 
They may then use the slander to vent their anger and may use the slander to justify additional aggressive behavior. For example, men who abuse their children are often angry about the circumstances of their lives. Uh, frequently, they have money problems. An abuser takes it out on the children, then slanders them by saying they provoked him, and then uses that defamation of their character as an excuse for continuing the abuse. Finally, in this uh, passage, malice is an attitude or an action that intends harm to someone, and that also can arise out of anger. Malice really means a lack of forgiveness. And once again, anger may be an understandable reaction to some kinds of hurt, but to nurse that anger by thinking or saying things, uh, doing things that would harm the person is to engage in what God says belongs only to him, vengeance. So Paul turns now from the negative finally to uh, positive, uh, from what to get rid of in our lives to what to incorporate. Look verse 32. This is a beautiful verse. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. God forgave you. Be kind. That's the word Christos, which means good, kind, benevolent. And it's a word which is used of God. That's one of the qualities of God. Peter uses that in his first uh, epistle where he tells us to crave spiritual milk like newborn babes, that we may grow up in our salvation now that we have tasted that the Lord is Christos, good, kind. So Paul is telling us here uh, once again to take on the qualities of God himself. We'll see more of that in the next chapter where he explicitly tells us to be imitators of God. Here he's already noting something of what that means. Now don't underestimate the importance of these positive attributes. The point is just this, it isn't enough to rid ourselves of the negative. To be kind means not just refraining from harming or hurting people, but actively doing something positive. You can get a sense of the value of kindness if you reflect upon a time when someone was kind with, toward you. Uh, very often it's a very inexpensive way to enrich someone else's life. Uh, sometimes it's just a simple act. Uh, but these acts stay with you. Uh, one that I remember, for example, when I was in seminary, I worked uh, as on a survey team during the summer, in a hot, humid summer in Louisville. We were out working one day, and we were digging holes uh, to check to see where the uh, how deep it had to go before it hit rock. It's it's pretty strenuous kind of work to be engaged in. And of course, doing this out in the hot sun and the humid weather. And all of a sudden we saw a woman come out of a house uh, over on the far end of where the property were, carrying a tray. You know what she did? She brought us a tray with glasses and a big jug of iced lemonade. <laughs> Uh, just out of the blue. She didn't know us. We didn't know her. But she knew that we were struggling and it was a simple act of kindness. I have never forgotten it. And be compassionate, Paul says. Uh, we think of the heart, by the way, as a symbol of inner self. The Hebrews thought of the kidneys or balls. So you could literally say that when compassion means having healthy bowels. But it's also used to mean compassionate or uh, tender-hearted or sympathetic. Compassion can be hard to practice because it does take energy and it does take time. But finally, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven each of us. That's Your forgiveness can be an absolutely cherished gift to someone. 
And just as the manifestations of anger are debilitating to relationships and self-destructing, the practice of kindness, compassion, and forgiveness are relationship enhancing and self-enhancing. Slander, malice, and so forth, all those others, they're lose-lose qualities. Forgiveness, kindness, and compassion are win-win qualities. In fact, they are healing qualities. I mentioned to you last week uh, something that Mother Teresa had, had written. I want to share with you today something that she once did. She told about visiting an old man in Melbourne, Australia, whom apparently no one even knew existed. His room was in terrible condition, and she offered to clean it. Well, he resisted, but she kept uh, prodding him about doing it, and finally he allowed her to do it. And as she worked, uh, she came across a dust-covered lamp and asked him why he didn't ever turn that lamp on. What far is this? Nobody comes to see me, and I don't need a lamp. She said to him, well, would you turn it on if the sisters came to see you? Yes, he said, if I hear a human voice, I'll turn it on. Well, sometime later, she got word from him. He sent word by one of the sisters, tell my friend that the lamp she lit in my life burns constantly. A simple act of kindness greatly enriched a man's life. That's living in amazing grace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.